Um, we have a great panel uh, who is going to focus on the Medicaid program, which is a lifeline that millions of Americans rely upon, particularly uh, at this very important moment in our country's uh, history. Uh, first, you're going to hear from my colleague, Steve Butterfield. He is the director of state policy for LLS, where he provides policy analysis and research for our state level government affairs work. Before joining LLS, Steve was po a policy director for a small but mighty health coverage nonprofit in his home state of Maine, where he also previously served as an elected member of the state's House of Representatives. Uh, Steve has a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Maine and a master's in global public policy from the EU's Erasmus Mundus Map program. Uh, after that, you'll hear from April Simpson. She is senior reporter at the Center for Public Integrity covering racial equity. She was previously the rural issues reporter at Stateline and then an initiative of Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, before joining Pew, April was associate editor of Current where she covered public media and won recognition for her Me Too investigation of a veteran reporter. Uh, she was a US Fulbright fellow in Botswana and an International Women's Media Foundation fellow in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. She was also the Innovations in Food and Agriculture Fellow with the National Press Foundation. Uh, April is a graduate of Smith College and the London School of Economics and Political Science. And finally, you will hear from Megan Messerly, a healthcare reporter at Politico covering state health policy, including Medicaid, the health insurance exchange, excuse me, the health insurance exchanges and public health. Uh, before joining Politico, Megan covered health policy, politics, and elections in Nevada for nearly seven years, first at the Las Vegas Sun and then at the Nevada Independent. Megan got her start reporting uh, as an intern for the San Francisco Chronicle. She has a bachelor's degree in English and media studies from UC Berkeley. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, April. And thank you, Megan. We're so delighted you're able to join us today, and uh, I invite Steve to kick us off. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, welcome uh, to all of you, and welcome to me. This is actually the first session I've been able to join um, from this event, so I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to, unfortunately, sorry to say, I do have slides for you, so let me see if I we love, we love your slides. get those going here. So, and Randy in the background, feel free to step in at any point if I um, end up messing anything else up here. So should all be able to see um, my starter slide here, America's largest health insurer. So really what I'm here to do um, is give you some sort of baseline knowledge of what we're really talking about when we talk about Medicaid. Um, and as this slide you know, sort of sets up for you, the first thing I think is really important to understand about this program is it is the single largest source of health insurance for anybody in the country. Um, it was created as part of the same act of Congress that created Medicare back in 1965. Um, and since then it has grown and grown and grown in all 50 states. And as we'll hear um, from Megan a little bit later, um, actually over the past two years, it has grown even bigger. If I was showing you the version of this slide two years ago, it would say that about one in every five Americans had coverage through Medicaid. Over the course of the public health emergency um, and the COVID-19 pandemic, that has actually grown to be about one in four Americans who receives their coverage through the Medicaid program. If we're talking about kids, that number gets even higher. Almost half of children in America receive their health care coverage uh, through Medicaid. It is the single largest payer for um, most rural hospitals, safety net hospitals, and children's hospitals. So when we talk about this program, I think keeping that scope in mind with everything else that we're going to talk about is really vital to understanding just how integral Medicaid is to the American healthcare system. Talk a little bit about how it works. Um, it is a state and federal partnership. So the uh, individual states and the federal government split the cost of the Medicaid program. Um, it depends on your state exactly how much the feds kick in, um, but at least half of the, of the costs of not only running the Medicaid program, the administrative costs, but also paying out the benefits are split between the federal governments and the states. Um, but it's up to the states to actually run and administer the program within their own individual borders. 
Um, it is an entitlement program. That means that it's there for you if or when you need it. If you qualify based on the program standards, and I'll talk about how you qualify in just a second, um, you get in. It's not the kind of thing where you know the money runs out in uh, June and everybody's going to get Medicaid for the year has already gotten it. It is an entitlement. It is there when you need it. In a lot of states, you may also hear about MCOs or CCOs, Medicaid Managed Care Organizations. These are another layer of administering Medicaid where private companies are contracted to sort of help states administer the program. So you may see, you know, in some states, people, people may see an insurance company like, you know, Cigna, United Health, Anthem, Aetna, um, a company like that may actually be who they think of as their insurance program because that's who administers the benefit in that state. But in fact, behind the scenes, they're really on Medicaid. So who qualifies? How do you actually get Medicaid? Um, there's a couple of different factors. You have to meet a couple of different standards. The first component that you always think about with Medicaid is income. You qualify based on your household income. And then the next way that you get through the door of Medicaid, assuming you qualify based on income, then we start looking on whether or not you're eligible based on sort of your circumstances. Kids are eligible for Medicaid. Parents of young children or guardians of young children in some cases are eligible for Medicaid. Um, in a lot of states, and I'll come back to this, adults below a certain income level who may not have kids are eligible for Medicaid. So you have to meet the income standard and you have to be eligible based on you know, a population standard um, that exists under the Medicaid program. And those are called categories. So you may hear somebody be called categorically eligible. And in the past, you may have heard non-cats or non-categoricals, um, people who would not have to be eligible under Medicaid. But, and this is something else that I think is important to keep in mind, the federal government sets the minimum standards for who has to be eligible based on you know, their um, population type and their income across all 50 states, but states have significant flexibility to exceed that baseline. They can go above and beyond. So you may qualify as a you know, parent of a young child at a much higher income level in one state than you would in a different state. States can exceed the income level. They can extend Medicaid coverage to other populations who aren't categorically eligible as a child or a parent of a child or somebody with a disability, um, but they would, you know, a state could optionally provide coverage for them. Um, so if you ever hear that, uh, you know, states need more Medicaid flexibility, just keep in mind they already have quite a bit. Something else that is really important to keep in mind is that Medicaid is very high quality coverage. Um, people who have Medicaid report um, much higher uh, access to care. Their self-reported health um, is much higher when they have Medicaid versus when they're going without coverage. There have been a lot of studies and a lot of research done on Medicaid's access um, to providers compared to private coverage. And it compares very favorably. It compares almost a parity um, for primary preventive care, hospital access, specialist access. Um, and most important of all, Medicaid dramatically reduces the financial impact that healthcare costs can take on you versus obviously being uninsured. So another topic that, of course, you have probably all heard a lot about over the last decade is Medicaid expansion. When the Affordable Care Act was passed, it required all states to extend coverage to all childless adults, those non-categoricals, up to 138% of the federal poverty limit. And then in 2012, there was a Supreme Court case that made that optional for states. And that is why you know, you've heard over and over again over the past um, 10 years, so many states you know, having this debate over Medicaid expansion, whether or not to expand. The map that you're seeing right now is the status of expansion um, right now. So 38 states and DC have expanded their Medicaid programs to cover everybody up to that 138% um, cutoff. There are 12 states that still have not. Um, I think, you know, from, from our perspective, thinking about where does the, the expansion fight go from here, I, the first thing I want to say is that in all of those orange states, all of the states that haven't expanded yet, there are activists and patients and advocates and, you know, state groups working so hard on these, you know, topics nonstop. And they, and I think, want to recognize that energy and their, you know, dedication to making sure that everybody can get coverage that they can afford and that uh, covers what they need it to. But North Carolina, um, it has been a very active and a very close debate in North Carolina um, in their budget negotiations. 
And South Dakota is an interesting case because they are actually going to be voting on expansion this November. But in July, I think they're going to be voting on another ballot campaign that may raise the threshold for that campaign in November. So as of right now, the way things stand, if nothing changes in July, a simple majority vote um, in South Dakota in the fall will potentially put Medicaid expansion on, into state law there. If this other ballot initiative in July passes, that will raise the threshold to, I believe, 60%. Um, so stay tuned there. Expansion is very popular. Um, there have been a number of states over the past uh, five years that have passed through ballot initiative Medicaid expansion campaigns in their state. So they didn't do it legislatively. They didn't do it through you know, some sort of administrative procedure. Um, it went on the ballot. And in all but one state where a ballot initiative campaign has been run, it has passed. Um, and I left the states up here. So you can see it's a mix of red states, blue states. It's across the whole country. Um, and it has passed, you know, I mean, you can see in Idaho, 60%, uh, more than 60% voted in favor of it. The one exception was Montana, where it was tied to a, a tobacco tax um, increase, and that was a little more complicated. But anywhere that it has been just a standalone popular vote on Medicaid expansion, the issue has passed. And that makes sense, because Medicaid as a program overall is actually incredibly popular. Um, Kaiser Family Foundation, if you're not familiar with Kaiser, they do incredible statistics. Um, they're a go-to source of info for me and a lot of others. Um, do polling on Medicaid's popularity pretty regularly. And consistently, it polls, as you can see here, 75% of people across the country view it either very or somewhat favorably. Um, and I left the breakdown here, but that is across all party affiliations, from 65% of Republicans to 85% of Democrats who really believe in the importance of this program um, as part of our healthcare fabric. I flew through all of that. <laughs> that was a lot of detailed um, info, but um, I want to make sure that we hand this over uh, to the folks that you're really here to hear about, uh, to hear from, um, which is April and Megan. Um, actually, Ryan, we switched things up on you. I'm going to hand it off to Megan here in just a second. Um, but I want to start here. I mentioned the public health emergency. There were some changes to how states can extend Medicaid coverage to people under the public health emergency that have, in essence, prohibited states from removing people from the Medicaid program as long as the public health emergency is in place. What that has meant in terms of sheer numbers, and I have two graphs here, um, the first one is just showing the growth in total Medicaid enrollment over the past two years of the public health emergency. And you can see it's just gone up and up and up. Um, this is the number of people who have gained coverage since the public health emergency started. And that has grown in all 50 states. Um, so enrollment is higher in every single state now than it was before the public health emergency. It has grown significantly. Um, and that's what Megan is going to talk about a little bit is what the country is facing as the public health emergency unwinds. Um, so Megan, I think I ran over my time and I'm so sorry, but I'm going to stop screen sharing and hand things over to you. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, that handoff. So good to be here with all of you today. Like Steve mentioned, I'll be walking you through uh, some of the changes that we saw with Medicaid during the public health emergency, and then also take a look at just what exactly we can expect to happen uh, when the public health emergency ends. Uh, and you're just going to have to bear with me. I don't have any fancy slides uh, for you like Steve did, but uh, we'll walk through uh, some of this information uh, and then I'll pass it off to April uh, to talk about what's going on in some specific states. So I think the best place to start out uh, is talking a little bit. We have to wind the clocks back to March uh, 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. So right at the start of the pandemic, Congress passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which, among many other things, uh, essentially uh, gave states a 6.2 percentage point uh, increase in the federal matching dollars that they receive for their Medicaid programs uh, if they met what are known as uh, certain maintenance of eligibility uh, requirements. And basically that's a fancy word for saying, you know, you got to keep people covered uh, during the public health emergency. And so as a result of that, um, we have been under a public health emergency uh, since then. It has not yet been lifted. Uh, so states, as a result, have kept every single person who was enrolled as of March uh, 2020. They are still enrolled in Medicaid to this day. 
Uh, anyone who has joined Medicaid since then uh, is still enrolled. There's some like minor technical things there, but for the most part, basically everyone is still enrolled and that contributed uh, or was the, basically the entire cause of uh, that in, those significant increases that Steve showed you on that slide there. So essentially, you know, states have not been allowed to kick folks off of their Medicaid roles. Uh, and as a result, we've seen them well. Um, yeah, looking at uh, the, the data I pulled over the first 16 months, you know, it was a, a nearly 20% increase uh, in the Medicaid population nationally. Um, so that sort of gives you the, the lay of the land. And part of the reason, you know, why Congress did this was, you know, they, they wanted to one, provide, you know, fiscal relief to states. Uh, but the other big part was preventing coverage losses during the pandemic. You know, something that's worth noting about Medicaid, you know, historically is we talk about this problem of Medicaid churn, where people because of, uh, you know, especially fluctuations in income month to month, uh, you know, you're eligible one month, uh, you pick up extra shifts uh, at work, uh, you take a promotion and suddenly you're not eligible. And so within Medicaid, you know, we commonly see this churn on and off of state Medicaid roles. Uh, throughout the year. And obviously it varies uh, state to state, but you know it's it's a substantial chunk of the Medicaid population uh, in each state usually that typically churns on and off in a given year, right? So um, there was some data uh, I had from Oregon, which now I don't have handy, uh, but basically showing that like, uh, I wanna say it was like somewhere in the realm of 25 to 30% um, of people who were enrolled in their, who enrolled in their state's Medicaid program in a given year had been previously covered under Medicaid uh, in the previous 12 months, right? So saying that like folks are really rapidly coming on and off of this program. And, you know, for, for those of us who have uh, private health insurance, or if you're covered under, um, you know, the uh, health insurance marketplace, you have coverage for a year, right? Um, that's not the case with Medicaid where we see these rapid changes. And so as a result, there's been this continuity of coverage, which has been really helpful uh, for folks who haven't had to worry about being kicked on and off of Medicaid uh, over the course of the year. So, you know, a lot of uh, really vocal proponents of Medicaid have seen this as, you know, a, a great thing for Medicaid. Um, you know, there's states like uh, states that are trying to implement continuous coverage requirements that, you know, mandate that um, either adults and or children remain covered, you know, for, for a longer period of time. So there's ways that states can address that uh, through policy, but, you know, all the same, that usual turn that we see did not happen during the pandemic. So now that brings us to where we are today, uh, which is thinking about what happens when uh, the public health emergency ends. So the public health emergency, lots of other things are tied to it. It's not just uh, it's not just this uh, Medicaid continuous coverage requirement. There's telehealth flexibilities. There's a lot of other things, um, but the one that folks are obviously very concerned about is that you're going to see the significant loss in coverage. Uh, when the public health emergency ends, as states to start to go through their Medicaid roles and look at who's eligible and who isn't, right? Um, you know, a lot of uh, folks, you know, look at the numbers and say, okay, yeah, there's a lot of folks who uh, probably make too much money to be on Medicaid. You know, they, they probably shouldn't be there. Um, but an estimate from, from the Urban Institute projects that, you know, 15 million people uh, could lose Medicaid coverage uh, when the public, public health emergency ends. And so the concern here is twofold. So one of the buckets is uh, people who, you know, because of, you know, changes in their life circumstances, income, they're no longer eligible for Medicaid. And so the big focus for, for states, which I'll get into a little bit more later, uh, is helping those tra folks transition to appropriate cover coverage. So if they already have employer-sponsored coverage, um, they would just you know be covered by those plans. Uh, if they don't have that coverage, um, it's helping them sign up for a plan uh, through the, the health insurance marketplace. Uh, so it's sort of one of the buckets. And then the other bucket are folks that are still eligible for Medicaid based on their income, uh, but they still need to go through that redetermined redetermination process. Uh, and, and this is really where states are probably most concerned that folks are going to fall through the cracks. Uh, renewing Medicaid seems like it should be easy, I don't know, theoretically, um, but it's not. It's a really complicated process. You know, there's a lot of technical, logistical things that need to happen. Um, you know, folks have to show proof of income. Um, it's not uh, super easy. And so the concern is that, um, you know, when states start sending out these notices saying the public health emergency has end, you know, if folks haven't provided the right information to the state, um, 
those folks might be kicked off of their Medicaid coverage uh, simply because they weren't able to complete the renewal process. And so that's kind of what states are focusing on uh, right now. But before we get into more of that and sort of the state plans, um, we should talk about the timing of when the public health emergency will end, which is the big question on everyone's mind. So uh, the public health emergency has been extended in 90 day increments. Uh, health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra has promised to give 60 days notice before the public health emergency ends. As of right now, the public health emergency is set to expire on July 15th. Uh, 60 days before July 15th was Monday, May 16th. Uh, May 16th came and went without uh, any notice uh, from HHS that the public health emergency ends. So uh, everyone is anticipating that means the public health emergency um, will likely be extended another 90 days uh, until uh, October. Uh, but of course, we're waiting for official confirmation. Uh, the last time this happened in April, uh, it was only a couple of days before the actual end of the public health emergency that um, it was officially renewed. So we're still waiting for an official indication on that. But um, HHS has affirmed its commitment to giving 60 days notice. Um, there was a letter uh, from Secretary Becerra um, uh, and CMS uh, Administrator uh, to states, uh, to state governors, essentially telling them, uh, yes, we still plan to give you 60 days notice. You know, we want you to be prepared for Medicaid redetermination, but we do promise that we will still give you this, this 60 days notice. So that's kind of where everyone uh, is at right now, sort of <laughs> trying to figure out uh, when this is all going to end. It's been this, uh, you know, perpetual question that keeps getting pushed out another 60 days and 90 days uh, over and over again. So thinking about what happens uh, in the States, I mean, you know, I, I think in healthcare, this this phrase uh, gets used a lot, but, you know, Medicaid directors like to say, if you've seen one state Medicaid program, you've seen one state Medicaid program, you've seen one state exchange, you've seen one state exchange, right? Every state uh, is their own uh, animal. They have their own policies and, and procedures. And so what's going to happen state by state is going to look very different depending on what state you're in. Um, so just thinking about some of the uh, pressures that might be on states as they, they move through this, you know, one of the concerns is um, they've received this enhanced federal matching rate, uh, you know, sort of in exchange for keeping these folks covered. Um, the concern is uh, that federal matching uh, money expires at the end of the quarter in which the public health emergency ends. So if it ends October 15th, uh, it would extend through the end of the year, December, which does give states a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, but the concern is uh, CMS has told states that it would like them to take uh, ideally the full you know, 12 months um, to complete this redetermination process. And I'll get into that a little bit more in, in a second, but they want them to go through this process slowly. And the issue is that states aren't going to keep receiving that enhanced federal matching fund, uh, those enhanced federal matching dollars um, throughout the duration of that process, right? You know, I talked to a lot of um, state Medicaid uh, officials who would like to see that uh, that FMAP, you know, extended until uh, the end of the redetermination process. That has not happened um, in Congress. So that's one of the pressures weighing on states is that if they don't have extra federal dollars, uh, it might incentivize them to work through this process quickly. And as I mentioned before, um, the faster you go through the process, the more likely you might have some of those folks falling through the cracks. And that's one of the things that state officials are really focused on is, you know, how do we how do we do outreach uh, to those folks? You know, they're getting them to update their names and addresses and phone numbers uh, to make sure folks uh, don't fall through the cracks. I know I'm running on short on time here, so I'm going to try to uh, I'll try to try to wrap this up in the next little bit. But there are other states, too. So uh, CMS has encouraged states to take. Uh, the full 12 months to do this. There's an extra two months. It's kind of a wonky thing, but they have an extra, uh, they have an extra two months to complete redetermination. So they have to start within uh, 12 months, but then they have an extra two months to wrap up uh, the process. Um, uh, there's a really great uh, survey done uh, by Kaiser of uh, state Medicaid officials that you can look at that shows um, states' plans for how quickly they plan to go through this process. Some plan to go through it more quickly. Some to plan to go through it less. Um, CMS, even though they're urging people to take the, the 12 uh, months, they've said that states should start processing no more than one ninth of their Medicaid population each month. And CMS has really put out a lot of guidance for states and is asking states to send in a lot of data. So the Biden administration has really signaled that they're going to be watching this closely and they don't want states to rush through the process because they don't want uh, folks falling through the cracks. Um, 
there's some talk uh, about states possibly uh, ending this early. So if they give up that federal matching rate, they they actually can um, start the redetermination process early. Um, I've, I've talked to some folks who say that there's chatter around this. There's nothing uh, set in stone, but that's something to be keeping an eye on as well. If states are looking at their budgets and saying, hey, given how much our Medicaid rolls have swelled, you know, it's just not financially worth it for us anymore to keep all these folks uh, on their rolls. Um, and uh, and keep paying for them, right? All these folks who may not be eligible for, for Medicaid coverage technically by income. Uh, so we're just gonna forego the FMAP and start now. So that, that's something to keep an eye on. Again, there's no states that have um, for sure announced that they're doing that. Uh, and then really briefly, I, I just like to think about some of the, the dichotomies here, things to watch for between states. So like Steve mentioned, there's gonna be a big difference in Medicaid expansion states versus states that have not expanded uh, Medicaid um, just by virtue of income levels, right? Um, there's folks that uh, you know will not be eligible in non-expansion states because their state hasn't expanded Medicaid. So they're gonna be kicked off of, of Medicaid simply because they don't qualify. So that's definitely something to keep an eye for. Like I mentioned before, states that rush through this process versus not, do folks uh, fall, the, fall through the cracks? Um, like I mentioned before, those two groups of people who are you know, procedurally denied, they should be eligible, but they're denied. And then folks who are ineligible, but should go to the exchange. Um, and we didn't even get into all of that, but that's a whole separate thing about how folks make that smooth transition. And there's a lot of um, disconnect in a lot of states between Medicaid and the exchange um, in states where there is a state-based state uh, exchange. It's even harder where there's a, a folks rely on healthcare.gov to make that transition. So that's something to watch for is do people make the transition to uh, to those marketplace plans? And then off of that point, um, just keeping keeping an eye on on the exchange side of things, the differences between states that have state based exchanges uh, versus those that rely on uh, healthcare.gov because they're going to see uh, different outcomes as well. Uh, and then really briefly, and then I'll turn it over to April. Um, all of this also is happening against the backdrop of this conversation about uh, ARPA subsidies so under the uh, American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, these extra uh, subsidies were approved for folks on uh, state or for plans on state health insurance exchanges on the federal marketplace as well um, to make coverage more affordable. Uh, those have resulted uh, last year, there were 2.5 million more people who enrolled in those uh, insurance, individual market insurance plans uh, after the subsidies went into effect. Uh, and there's a lot of concern among folks that um, those uh, subsidies expire at the end of the year. And if they're not renewed by Congress, that will make uh, folks that sort of hope that the ARPA subsidies would provide a, a softer landing for some of these people because they make premiums more affordable, um, both for folks on like the lowest income side and for folks who made hundred uh, over 400% of federal poverty level, they could qualify for subsidies they never qualified for before. So there's a lot of concern about if those ARPA subsidies are not extended as they're currently set to expire, that could make this process even more difficult. So I could go on. Uh, I probably took too much time, but I am going to turn it over to April, who uh, will be talking about a story she wrote looking at Medicaid in Mississippi and Louisiana. Great, thank you, Steve and Megan for your rich presentations. Um, I think we can agree Medicaid is very complicated. Um, for this particular story that I'm gonna talk about, I spent a lot of time um, interviewing experts and officials and advocates and um, people just to understand the system, um, its historical roots, how it's changed over time, um, how Medicaid operates and is experienced at the state level. Um, I became really interested in how different access to care can be uh, for people in expansion versus non-expansion states. Um, so let me break it down with examples of uh, two stories of two men. Um, Gabriel Muhammad is a 40-year-old self-employed carpenter and plumber in Jefferson County, Mississippi. And Alvin Brown is a 46 year old man who stocks liquor and wine for retail outlets in Madison Parish, Louisiana. Uh, so there are two men of similar age. They live miles from each other, um, just on opposite sides of the Mississippi River in Louisiana and, and Mississippi. Um, but each one faced a medical emergency and one had his bill largely taken care of. Uh, while the other is uninsured and had to pay off his bill bit by bit. So what's the difference? Um, Gabriel Muhammad in Mississippi has an income of no more than $10,000 a year, 
as a self-employed carpenter and plumber. And in October, he was hit with a $1,400 hospital bill for an MRI scan to diagnose why he wasn't breathing properly. Um, he got stuck with this bill because Mississippi has an expanded Medicaid. Um, and that means single adults without children like Muhammad are not eligible for public health insurance, regardless of how little they earn each year. Uh, whereas Alvin Brown, who's in Louisiana, was able to get help. Um, last May, Alvin started feeling bad, his back hurt, it was painful for him to go to the bathroom. And, you know, the next day he visited the emergency room at his local hospital. Um, a doctor told him he was passing a kidney stone and prescribed him medication. Uh, a couple days passed and Alvin was still feeling lousy. Um, so he wanted a second opinion. He did a bunch of running around. He visited a couple more hospitals, was referred to a kidney specialist, and eventually admitted to a hospital nearly an hour away from where he lives. And that hospital found he was dehydrated. And as a result, his uh, kidney, one of his kidneys was uh, beginning to malfunction. Um, Alvin has an annual household income of $28,000 for a family of three. Um, and that puts him just under the threshold of earning 138% uh, of the federal poverty level to qualify for Medicaid coverage. Um, and then being enrolled in the program saved him from paying $7,000 of his $9,000 hospital bill. Um, you know, $9,000, that's basically a third of his income, his household income. Um, so, you know, access to health insurance is something that affects people like Gabriel and Alvin in their daily lives. Um, Gabriel in Mississippi, he's uninsured. He tries to avoid going to the doctor. He only goes when he's feeling really ill. And when he does go, it's to his local community health center and he'll pay up to $40 for that visit. Um, in this case, he went to the community health center and he was facing a medical emergency. Um, whereas Alvin Brown in Louisiana was actually saved from crushing medical debt at the last minute. When he became sick, he, he thought he had supplemental insurance and it had expired. Um, and when he was at the hospital, a staffer checked in with him, um, made sure he qualified for Medicaid, signed him up, and that coverage kicked in just in time to take care of his bill. So you know, these are important stories, um, but obviously so is the data that shows why these stories um, are important in a larger context. And there is so much data when you're looking at Medicaid. Um, so what I try to do is just point to those most important data points in the story and then try to, you know, humanize the data by focusing on Gabriel and Alvin, um, and, but also their larger communities. So Jefferson, Co Jefferson County, Mississippi, and Madison Parish, Louisiana, um, like I said, they're both on that Mississippi River uh, border. And um, to some extent, they're also characters in the story. I wanted to show that, you know, beyond what's happening with Medicaid at the same, same level, or, or excuse me, state level, these were two demographically similar communities. They had similar histories and that they both derived their early wealth from slavery and a plantation economy. Um, today, they're both among the poorest and the blackest counties in the country. And they both happen to be named for former presidents and slave owners. Um, but because of Medicaid expansion, healthcare access looks very different in these two places. Um, prior to the Affordable Care Act, uh, more than 20% of adults younger than 65 in both these counties were uninsured. And then their paths diverged in Madison Parish, Louisiana, the uninsured adult population plunged eight percentage points since 2015, um, while in Jefferson County, it stayed about the same. And then on top of that, in Madison Parish, Louisiana, Access to health insurance for the working poor has cut the amount of unpaid care costs for insurers and patients. And what that basically means is in this one dimension, um, rural hospitals in Louisiana are often on better financial footing than rural hospitals in Mississippi and in other non-expansion states. So um, again, Gabriel and Alvin, they have important stories, but how do you find people like them? Um, it can be challenging to find people who 
are willing to go in depth on their medical histories, especially when we're going to talk about finances and debt. Um, I often go through advocates to find sources, um, but some had warned me that it would, might be difficult to find people to share their stories, um, and some were able to find me people outside of Jefferson County and Madison Parish. Um, so I actually didn't have any luck going through that route in finding these guys. Um, but I did have some pretty strong sources on the ground and they were able to point me in the right direction. Um, I don't recommend this, but I, I traveled to Mississippi and Louisiana before having some of those key people like um, Jay Brill and Alvin in place. Uh, but I also knew that because in Jefferson County, um, for example, 20% of the adult population is uninsured, I knew I'd likely be meeting people who kind of checked the boxes that I needed to check while I was just doing my regular reporting around town. So I found Gabriel when I was doing that on the ground reporting in Mississippi. I had a source who was just taking me around for the day. And he introduced me to Keith Gabriel. At the time, he was doing carpentry work at uh, a furniture store on Main Street. He is a part of this very tight-knit Muslim community in Jefferson County. And he immediately wanted me to meet his spiritual leader. And I did that. And I think basically through showing respect to this community leader, learning more about the Muslim community there, having been introduced to Gabriel by someone he trusted, um, that I was slowly able to get him to open up to me. And, um, you know, over several conversations, I realized, okay, he fits the profile of the person that I wanted to focus on in Jefferson County, which was someone who was homegrown, single, without children, um, working and low income. And I had a similar story in finding Alvin Brown. Um, I actually never met him in person, but I had built trust with another source who knew that I needed to find someone who fit a very specific criteria. She connected me to Alvin Brown, and it was only because Alvin trusted her that you know he was open to talking to me. So I hope this is helpful. Um, I think Ryan already shared one, a link in the chat. I'm going to share some of the links that are relevant to this story. Um, but thank you guys so much for your time and for the opportunity to talk about all this. Thank you, April. Uh, thank you, Megan. And thank you, Steve. Um, I'd, I'd like to kick it off, April. I've, I've got a question for you. And, um, you know, someone uh, on, a, uh, on a different panel yesterday, one of the questions uh, for, for one of the journalists was, um, you know, how, how, how do you avoid preaching to the choir? And I, I know I know you're based in Texas, which is a non-expansion state. Um, I, I don't know if they're uh, in the on the call right now, but I know there are journalists um, who are signed up and we'll certainly be sending them this video from uh, Texas and Georgia and North Carolina, uh, and I think a few from Florida. So a fair number of participants from non-expansion states. Um, you know, how, what's, what's your advice for them on how to how to sort of keep telling these stories when um, you know and, and, and might feel they're they're banging their head against the wall. I mean, I I love the creative way you you approached it by sort of showing uh, folks uh, you know it, it doesn't necessarily have to be this way. Yeah, I think that's definitely hard. Um, and I did try to take a different approach and you know looking at these two border communities um, and kind of a shorter piece that I did prior to that one was um, talking to a community health center that had offices in one in an expansion state and the other in a non-expansion state and um, you know the, the challenges that that posed for them in, in providing care to folks. Um, I think just, I mean, in this moment, I cover racial equity. So just looking at kind of the racial histories around Medicaid expansion and what that means. Um, I focus on the Deep South. So I feel like that's, you know, especially with the pandemic, that's another avenue that, that folks can go down. Yeah, and as, as, as I mentioned, one of the things I enjoyed so much about reading your stories was how you, um, how you brought history into it, which I thought was um, um, made them even, even richer stories. Um, you know, M Megan, um, as we approach at some point, the end of the public health emergency. Um, 
you know, cu curious to know your, your, your perspective. It seems like nothing throughout the history of the pandemic has has run smoothly to say the least what's you know if you if 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 you were a uh, you know to sort of look at your crystal ball um you know what what what, what do you think we're going to see um in in these dates you know they they've had lots of time to prepare to prepare for this uh they know you know this is coming down the pike are are they prepared for it or is this is this going to be a mess yeah it's a great question I I would I would split the the states in into two buckets and I, I don't even know which which states I'd put in each bucket at this point but um I feel like there are two buckets right there are states that are uh really committed to this they really want to make it work they've been throwing everything they can at this um you know are, are putting forward really innovative uh you know solutions like California it's always California you know doing a lot of this because they have the resources but you know, they're, they're basically trying to make um, the process uh, between Medicaid and the exchange work in such a way that basically like everything is done for you and you just have to click like one box, you know, and they're really trying to streamline that. So you, you know, you get put into the plan on the exchange that's right for you. If, you know, with your Medicaid MCO, um, it's the plan that like most aligns with you, um, same carrier. Um, and, and it gets you into that affordable plan. And so they're really trying to make it like as, as easy on a person as possible uh, to do this. But, you know, not every state is California and has the resources to do that. And often a lot of these states are working with these really antiquated systems. I mean, like if everyone remembers what happened with, um, you know, the unemployment systems, right? At the beginning of the pandemic, it was just, uh, e even though, you know, state officials really wanted to help folks, like the system just couldn't support it. And I think that's a lot of what we're facing potentially here is these systems that just don't work the way you think they might work, right? Um, you know, in a lot of states, you know, Medicaid and uh, the health insurance exchange, if there is a state-based exchange, like they're not housed in the same department, right? Like those systems don't talk to each other. There are file transfers that happen, but it's just not like, you think in this day and age where, you know, we have like Amazon and Facebook and Twitter, like all these data platforms, like healthcare does not work that way. Like the, the systems do not talk to each other. And so something that might seem like, okay, Medicaid knows this person is ineligible and they make X amount of dollars. We're going to transfer that file over to the exchange. Like that seems like it could be an easy process in the year 2022, but it is not at all an easy process. So, you know, I think there's just significant logistical hurdles, even for the states that are really you know, well-intentioned, they want to go through this as slowly as possible. You know, they have the budgets to be able to work through this in a really methodical way. Then you have the second group of states, which either because of financial pressures or political pressures are going to have to move through this as quickly as possible. So we've seen this in Ohio, um, you know, Ohio's passed a budget that basically said you have to do these uh, redeterminations within 90 days, uh, which is just like that given the amount of work, that's just a very short amount of time. Um, and so in the second group, I think like just the pressure to get through this quickly, you're going to see more problems and more folks fall through the cracks. And so I guess the short answer is, you know, who knows, I guess we'll kind of see what happens, but I, I know even talking to uh, Medicaid officials and exchange directors in states that are like, really, really like, we, we want to get people into the coverage that's right for them. We, we, we want this process to work. Like they're even concerned about how this is going to be right. Just because it is such a big lift. Um, so we'll find out what happens when we finally have a, have a date. Is, is there a role for, for journalists who are working at the, you know, at the local level or the regional level to let people know this is coming? Definitely, definitely. Yes. And, and something that, um, you know, Medicaid officials and exchange directors have been talking about is like, how do you reach folks at the right moment? You know, a lot of them have been trying to get folks to update their contact information uh, so that when it comes time to reach out to them, you know, they can do that. Some have been worried though about like asking for that information too early because you tell people to update their address and phone number and then they do. And then six months later they move and then you ask them again and they're like, but I already did that. And, you know, so it's trying to catch people at that right, um, you know, sort of window of opportunity. And that, I mean, that's a really big challenge uh, right now. But I, I think as far as journalists, I think twofold, just like, yeah, one, getting the word out that this is coming. I mean, it's good for folks to know that this is, is coming, even though there's nothing they can really do about it right now, um, other than, yeah, make sure their contact information is, is updated. But two, to really hold um, state officials accountable about what their, what their plans are going to look like. Um, you know, a lot of states, states are going 
many states have like internal plans. They're going to have to share those plans with CMS. Um, but like ask your state officials about what they're doing to prepare for all of this, both on the Medicaid side. Um, and if you're like eligibility, if the eligibility determination is separate from Medicaid, like talk to those folks and then also talk to the exchange folks and just figure out like what the plan is and where the possible gaps are, where the cracks are, where people are going to fall through the holes and get a sense of like, okay, are they, are they doing everything they can be doing? Like, what are, what are the hurdles, right. To preparing for this. But that, I mean, again, like every state is going to approach this in a different way. Every, there might be similar challenges across the states, but um, it's really important for, for, yeah, I, you know, I, I just came to Politico from Nevada. I worked in Nevada for six and a half years. Like it's so important to be asking these questions and like getting in the weeds with your, your state officials to figure out really what's going on. Thank you. That's um, that's very helpful, um, Steve. You know, let's let's bring bring this back to patients for us. You know, as we're, as we're talking about, you know, what why it's so important that uh, you know people people don't lose their Medicaid coverage when the emergency ends, or or why it's so important um, for expansion to occur in some of these holdout states. Uh, what, you know, what what does the data show? You know, in, in particular for you know this this is the covering cancer policy event. What does it show for cancer patients? That's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, I think we, I think we all sort of know, obviously, that you know, in this country, access to care starts with access to coverage. Um, you know, in April, I think your story really highlights. We know what's going to happen, right? If we go to a doctor, or go to the hospital, and we don't have insurance coverage, um, and you know, there's a lot of evidence showing that people, you know, avoid care even when they are insured because sometimes the out-of-pocket costs can be so high. Um, but when you're uninsured, you avoid care and you avoid care and you avoid care. So for the cancer space, you're talking about things like catching a diagnosis um, earlier in you know, your um, disease progression can make a huge difference in your survivorship and outcomes. You're more likely to catch that early if you have access to you know, affordable and reliable primary care that can you know, refer you to the right specialists. Um, I will say, I think I'm using this term correctly, breaking news today, in fact, um, just published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute um, was a study uh, from our friends over at the American Cancer Society, you know, going back to expansion, showing a positive correlation in cancer survivorship outcomes in states that have expanded Medicaid versus those that haven't. Um, and actually, again, April, going back to, you know, you mentioned um, racial and ethnic disparities and, and rural disparities certain racial and ethnic minorities and people who are in rural areas tend to have lower survivor or, or their survivorship rates show disparities with people who live in more urban areas or people who um, you know are members of other population groups and what the study from ACS um, showed and I'll drop the link in the chat um, in just a second here for you all. Um, this also showed a link in closing some of those disparities in states where Medicaid has expanded. So in other words, when you expand Medicaid, people have better survivorship outcomes and you start shrinking some of those gaps. Um, I think this said, especially non-Hispanic black individuals um, really shrank some of those um, disparities in outcomes. So it matters enormously. I mean, this is not, you know, um, really academic uh, anymore. I think, you know, we're really seeing those outcomes really demonstrated in how long people can live with and treat, you know, the conditions that they have, so. Um. Tell, tell tell us a little bit, and, and I'll you know I'll, I'll I'll throw this to whoever would like to answer it. But you know, as we as we look at that that map, um, you know the, the twelve states that have you know holding out on Medicaid expansion. Um, you know what's what what's the outlook going to be? I mean, Steve, the the uh, you know I keep I keep going back to the you know thinking about the polling data you showed and how. Uh, how popular this is and, and how many people are on this program. Um, you know, if, if you're looking at your crystal ball, um, you know, how, how many of those states do you think are, are going to flip? What's coming down the pike? And, you know, several of those states, um, you know, have, have advocacy efforts that are further along than others, but tell us a little bit about what's on, what's on the horizon there. Oh boy. Um, if you're asking for a political prognostication, I mean, the optimist in me wants to say, you know, we're always closer to tomorrow than we were yesterday. You know, like I said, the the energy around this in uh, in those states has been, you know, I'm for Maine. We were a non-expansion state until we were the first um, to do it through a ballot initiative. I think the political reality is when you look at, you know, who who is in leadership positions in the remaining states, what their position and you know maybe their base constituency position has been on this issue. 
and how long they've been sort of holding out on this. I think it gets, I hate to say it, but it gets a little tougher to see, you know, when we get to 50, um, looking at it through that lens. You know, I mean, I can't remember the exact number, but I want to say maybe a third, maybe even more than a third of the of the remaining folks left who would be eligible for Medicaid coverage if all the states expanded are in Texas. Um, so Texas and Florida alone account for a huge portion um, of the remaining individuals who should be eligible but aren't. And it seems like no matter what the federal government has done to sort of sweeten the pot, you know, and, and make the deal better um, for holdout states, it hasn't really pulled any of these um, remaining states over the line yet. Um, you know, they've talked about enhancing the amount, you know, the federal government will pick up, you know, all or almost all of the tab for like the first five years and then almost all of it in perpetuity um, for this expansion population. That hasn't made the difference. Um, and I think that's why you saw around, you know, a lot of the discussions around Build Back Better um, and that package over the past, you know, nine uh, months or so. Part, a big part of that conversation on the healthcare side of that package was, is there a way for the federal government to sort of circumvent those 12 holdout states and create a federal version of expansion um, that satisfies, you know, the Supreme Court requirements, um, but, you know, provides coverage and relief um, to the individuals in those states who should be eligible and haven't been. That was a whole other interesting debate that we could probably have an entire session on just unpacking some of the, you know, the congressional um, discussion there, but I would love for the sake of, you know, the tens of millions of people who are still eligible and haven't gotten coverage yet um, to say that, you know, I think we'll get there in the next five years. I don't know if I could say that with a straight face. So, but, you know, we continue to work on it and a lot of other advocates and allies do too. Um, it, April, I'd, I'd love to ask you, you know, you, you talked a little bit in your presentation about how you, found patients who are, you know, willing to talk about their coverage and, um, you know, these, you know, very, you know, pretty, the two most sensitive things people can talk about in their lives, probably their, their money and their health. Um, but, but beyond kind of identifying those people, I mean, can you tell me a little bit about um, kind of that, you know, those conversations you, you have with people and that, that really delicate work of you know how how do you gain people's trust uh, and, and because it, it's so hard to tell these stories and make people you know make people care without hearing you know from from you know as Steve said the patients who are really impacted by this so just you know curious if you have any thoughts on how to help help gain trust as you interact with patients who and, and share their stories. Um, I think it requires a lot of patience and kind of taking the lead of the person that you're you're speaking with. Um, I mean, there's some people who just want to tell you everything from, from the get-go, and then there are others that you just kind of have to, I mean, sometimes I'll just maybe put something out there to see how they respond, and if they are, if they seem open, we can kind of continue down that line, and if not, I maybe pull back a little bit, but it's, it's a bit of a dance, um, and I defer to the other person in terms of their comfort with, um, with Gabriel, I mean, he was very talkative. And like I said, we talked a lot about his religion and the things that he liked in his community and kind of what was important to him uh, before we got to the point of me learning about his, um, you know, emergency visit. So I think it's it's just, um, for me at least, it's been following the lead of the person that I'm, I'm talking to. That's good, uh, good, good advice. Um, well, thank you so much, April. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Steve. This was really enlightening. I, I learned a lot from this session, and we are so grateful you were able to join us today. Thank you again.